When I first got into serviced accommodation, I knew all the theory, you know, I'd done loads of research and reading on what I was supposed to do, but I was completely terrified of the unknown because I'd never done it before and you don't know what you don't know. And on this video, I'm going to break down five top things that I learned that I wish I would have known just because I want to help and give value and I want to see as many people doing rent serviced accommodation as possible. I'm Simon, I've done countless rent to rent deals, purchases, SA, HMOs, I've got nothing to sell, I'm just adding mad value. That sounds good, you're in the right place. So the first thing that really, really screamed out to me was you've got to find a way to do a self check-in. Because at the beginning, I was concerned and I'd read all these things that you're supposed to go down and build rapport and find out how long the guests are in town and you know do all these checks and show them how to work stuff and I was almost gonna do that and then I was like this is gonna be too time intensive it was actually Lucy it was she was like hang on a minute let's just systemize it from day one so what I would really really recommend is if you want to be in serviced accommodation you start to really think about how you're gonna make the check-in as self-automated as self-check-in as possible. You don't want to have to do anything. So right from booking, what we've got now is we've got automated emails that go out, automated messages. We've got guide videos that the guests receive and all we need to do is give them the individual key safe code. Okay. Everything else takes care of itself. <laughs> that rhymes. Everything else should just be automated. So that's a key, key tip that you need to do right at the beginning, because if not, you're going to have guests booking on instant book at nine, 10 o'clock, and you're going to have to go down there and it's going to drive you absolutely mental. So don't do it. In all this time of being in service accommodation for two and a half years, I've like never gone and done a check-in. I think maybe one time I was in the area, I was at the property picking something up and I accidentally did one, but you just want to make it completely automated. Another thing I quickly learned was you can't be reliant on one target client. Okay, you've got to have a broad spectrum of people that you can target your property at. So at the beginning, I was thinking it was going to be enough to be in a city centre and focus on, you know, tourism and leisure and people, you know, going to visit kids at university and, you know, all that stuff. And it quickly dawned on me that what you really want is you want to find a property that can get those people. Yeah, but. You also want to get the corporate clients and you want to get the construction clients and you want to have other business clients from local businesses and stuff, whether they're training or whether they've got temporary contracts. Because then you get the weekend leisure guests, you get the Monday, Friday corporate guests, and every now and then you'll get a belting long three or six monther. So the best way of doing this, okay, is to choose areas where you're quite close to tourism attractions or you know a city center you've got parking because guess what you know contractors love the van they're going to want their transit van outside you know you've got multiple beds um you want to go quite high end to attract the tourism so if you go too low end you're not going to attract any tourism but if you go too high end and you get your construction lads in just you know just having a laugh and that and drinking beers and stuff then that might not be a good fit so what i've done in my business is I've gone for areas where they appeal to a lot of different people. You've got parking, you've got multiple beds. They're high end, but they're not stupidly high end because then I can make them affordable. And that means 100% occupancy. Right now, I'm looking uh, August 2021, 100% occupancy across the whole portfolio. And it's a good place to be. Number three, find the demand before the property. That's key. Because if you can do that, you deleverage your risk so much. So what I've done is, I actually done this by accident, in fact. When I had my first rent to HMO, I just put it on Airbnb just to see what would happen. And I started getting booking requests. And I was like, what? It's like, what? In my area? Like, I'm just in a little town. And I started getting more and more requests. And I could see the type of requests they were. So what I would urge you to do, don't kill me, Airbnb. Or, or spare room or whatever, but do yourself some dummy ads across a couple of different platforms and see where the demand's coming from. And you can experiment with different areas and stuff. Obviously, don't 
go crazy because at the end of the day, you don't want people to be like, oh yeah, I found a great place and then you let them down. Turn Instant Book off. Um, and then of course, massive hack. If you want to be by the book and you know not get chucked off the platforms, try AirDNA. AirDNA is an amazing platform which will show you the occupancy. It will show you the demographic, the age groups. It will show you the demands, the average room rates, the amount of hotels, the amount of service accommodation units so that you can try and find that sweet spot before you commit to a property. And that's important whether you're rent to in the property, rent to serviced accommodation, but it's even more important if you're gonna buy it. Do not buy a property if you're not 100% sure it's gonna work in terms of serviced accommodation because you're gonna to have to get the right specialist mortgage product and then you're gonna put it online and it not work and then you're gonna be stuck because you're gonna to need to get consent to let in other ways. Yeah, that's right. If you're finding this useful, hit the subscribe button, weekly content right here. Another wicked way of assessing the demand is to speak to other service accommodation providers. Find out how their occupancy rates are because as much as these computers and dummy ads and air DNA are good, you just can't beat knowing Danny up the road that's got five SA units and checking out his demand. Big up Danny. Next up, parking. I cannot, I cannot overstress this. Parking is everything in SA. Don't get me wrong, you'll have some leisure guests that get on the train, but typically the most frequently asked question I get is, is there parking? Do you have enough parking for two cars? Can we arrive earlier and park? You know, everybody wants to bring cars, especially when we're talking about construction workers that, as I said earlier, are gonna want their transit vans. So, when I'm looking into a unit, parking is paramount. If there's no parking, I'm out because even if they don't need parking, it just takes out a massive part of the market and you don't want to do that. So find a place with parking. I have had situations where maybe it's been permit parking, but I've been able to provide visitor passes or, you know, if you, know, you can't park right outside it, but you can park on the next road, that might be passable as long as there is parking. But if somebody's got a nice whip, nice car and, you know, this, that and the other, they're going to want to probably park right outside the house and you've got your contractors that might have loads of tools in their van, they're gonna ideally want secure off-road parking. So keep that in mind. Last but not least, and I found this out the hard way, you want to do due diligence on your guest. Don't cut corners here, okay? Um, really tricky when it's booking.com and it's instant book, you just need to make sure at that point that you've got your correct check-in process, that you're getting ID, that you're taking security deposits, okay? That you're checking for chargebacks and all those bits and bobs. But on Airbnb, a lot of the time, especially at the moment, I'm choosing to turn off Instant Book so I can look into the guests. And I've had situations this week where I've looked at guests, in fact, it happened to me at the weekend, I got a booking request, it's for two nights, Friday, Saturday night. I actually initially was thinking about approving it. On closer look, I could see they'd had no reviews, they'd just joined, they had no profile picture. They lived about a mile up the road from the property and there were just too many red flags. So I just declined it. So you wanna make sure that at the beginning, you do your due diligence and you take your time and then make sure that you've got the security features in place in terms of at the property and in terms of your checks before people come into your property. Because that's the thing with SA, it's all good until it's not all good. And it's hard to teach that. You ain't really gonna learn that on the course until you get a deal and you actually try it out. I actually just got a phone call a minute ago and found out that apparently the guest that's coming in has got two pit bulls and I was completely oblivious. They've not asked me for permission. It says on the T's and C's, no dogs. Now I've got to make a phone call. Awkward phone, I love dogs, but boy, you know what I mean? You've got to make a phone call. So make sure you do your own due diligence and make sure you've got systems in place before you let guests into your property. It could save you thousands and thousands of pounds. So rent service accommodation, it is a beast. 
It's a B, so low money in and massive lumps of cash possible. Some of my units are doing over two, three grand net a month right now. And one of my mentees actually had a 12 grand net, 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 net cash flow month from just four units. How many of them do you need to change your life? If you found this useful, hit the subscribe button, check out all the content, hit the like button, comment below with any questions, and I'll see you in the next video.